Yeah, I think, you know, I object to the framing that people often put, which is we have these data, you know, these satellite data, and then we have models over here and we can compare them. And if they disagree, well, data obviously rules models because the satellite observational record is actually not what I would consider to be data. It's, it's, uh, and so, so let me explain what that means. So what does a satellite actually measure? Well, the satellite doesn't measure temperature. It measures radiance, which means it measures uh, basically photons of, of energy that the atmosphere is emitting. In fact, what it really measures is voltage on some detector. And from that, it has to infer radiance, which is, you know, these photons that are coming out of the atmosphere. And then from that, they want to derive temperature. How do they do that? Well, they use a model. Now, they don't call it a model. They call it a retrieval algorithm, but it's a model. And so when you compare the satellite data to a climate model, what you're comparing is the, the model, which is a climate model, to the satellite observations, which have been processed by a model. And so it's not nearly the sort of the black and white, we have data and we have a model. You're really comparing two models in a lot of respects. And if you look at the history of the satellite data, the model that has been used has been shown repeatedly to be wrong. So I can give you a little bit of a history of that. Uh, so in the early, uh, so the satellite data record came along in the late 80s, early 90s, when Spencer and Christie first uh, uh, first started uh, publishing that those data. And then by the, and at first it showed that troposphere was actually cooling, the lower atmosphere was cooling, which was really a weird result given that all of the other data showed that the surface was warming, so you'd expect the atmosphere to warm along with it. And so then in the mid-90s, they discovered an error in the model that they used to interpret the satellite data. They didn't take into account the fact that the orbits of the satellites were changing. And that turns out to be an important factor. Um, and so uh, Spencer and Christie made a bunch of changes to their algorithm, and their trend didn't change very much. And it turns out it didn't change very much because they introduced a new error at that point. And I'll talk about that in a second. Then um, uh, in the early 2000s, uh, Chung Fu at the University of Washington uh, realized that this atmospheric measurement, which really showed a very small trend, uh, actually included part of the stratosphere in addition to the lower atmosphere. And the stratosphere is cooling. And so what you're doing is you're averaging a warming mass and a cooling mass. And so the average trend is going to be lower because you've got this cooling part of the atmosphere averaged in. And so this, strictly speaking, isn't an error, but it shows you that even 15 years after the data set was released, they were still, understand, they were still trying to understand what the measurement actually meant. And then uh, a few years later, uh, the error that was introduced in 1998 uh, was discovered, and that was an error in the diurnal cycle. So what that, the diurnal cycle is the 24-hour cycle of temperature. It's warm in the day, it's cool at night. And Spencer and Christie had the opposite sign of diurnal cycle. They had a cooler during the day and warmer at night. And, um, and that ended up being another mistake. And, and I don't want to bash them because everybody makes mistakes, and I'm going to presume everybody's being honest. But I would just point out that imagine the howls you would get if it turned out that a climate model had the wrong diurnal cycle. If a climate model predicted it was warmer at night during the day, you would hear people on the other side just screaming bloody murder. How can you believe this? It's you know These people are incompetent. How can you possibly believe a model that has this wrong sign of diurnal cycle in it? The physics is obviously all screwed up. Uh, but of course, you don't hear anybody talk about that with satellite data. And it goes to show you the amount of confirmation bias that's actually going on in this debate, that these people accept the satellite data with completely uncritically because it tells them what they want to hear. And that, you know, they could uncover any error in the world in the satellite data, and the satellite data would never lose its privileged position because it is what they peg their hopes to. You know, this shows us that climate change isn't happening or the models are wrong or you know, insert whatever your talking point is, and they can't give it up. You know, they cannot give that up. So there's no error that would be bad enough for them to say, well, maybe we won't trust this data set. So that's, I mean, that's really telling. Um, uh, anyway, getting back to the satellite data, in the years since 2005, when the diurnal cycle problem was um, discovered, um, there have been other issues, uh, including how they stitch. The, the satellite record is put together from many satellites, how they stitch that together. And it looks like they still have problems in the diurnal cycle. That turns out to be a really hard adjustment to make. They still haven't gotten that right. So the bottom line is uh, I don't trust the satellite data. I think the satellite data are interesting. I think that it's a work in progress. I don't think it's good enough to validate or invalidate the climate models. It's something you can kind of compare them to. You can say, hmm, but I don't. Uh, 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 if they disagree, I'm not going to say the models are wrong. 
the climate models are wrong. I think it's, it's just as likely, if not more likely, that the, that the retrieval algorithm that uh, uh, is being used, and, and that actually includes, I think, RS, you know, there are two groups that do the satellite records. There's Alabama and RSS, remote sensing service. I think they both have problems in their dynamo cycle calculations. And so I actually don't think either of them are right. And I think that uh, work, it, you know, people are working on it. They'll get to the bottom of it eventually, um, but they have yet to get to the bottom of, of that issue. Well, what other temperature measurements are there? Well, obviously, there's a surface thermometer network. I think that actually is very robust. There have been many groups working at completely independent work groups, uh, and they all come up with essentially exactly the same answer. And there haven't been the kind of revisions to the surface record that there have been to the satellite record. I mean, obviously, there are revisions. There are always revisions to every data set as new data come along and people understand it. But you look at the kinds of errors they've discovered in the satellite record, uh, they're not nearly the same kinds of errors in the surface record. So I think the surface record is actually quite a bit more robust than the satellite record. And I trust that, uh, I trust that much more than I trust a satellite record. Uh, so then, but, but as scientists, you, for a claim as important as the Earth is warming, uh, you want to look at lots of data. You want to have lots and lots of data. And so what you can do is you can look at other parts of the climate system that should respond in predictable ways if the climate is warming. So an example is ice. You know, we know ice melts reliably at 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And so on a warming climate, you expect ice to be disappearing. And sure enough, if you look around the climate system, uh, sea ice in the Arctic is disappearing. Um, uh, glaciers are disappearing, big ice sheets are melting. Now, interestingly, you often hear people say, oh, but we're not losing sea ice in the Antarctic. And that's, that's right, we're not losing sea ice in the Antarctic. But if you look at the surface temperature trends, uh, the surface temperature trends are very low in that region. The surface temperature trend, where the surface temperature trends are the highest is in the Arctic, and that's where you're losing sea ice. So actually, the data fit together very nicely. You know, you're not losing sea ice in the places where the, you don't think it's warming that fast. And so, you know, things, things do seem to fit together and there's this real consilience, as E.O. Wilson might say, among the data. You know, it fits. It's not a house of cards where if you pull one data set out, the whole thing collapses. It's more of a web where if you cut one strand, the web is still, <coughs> excuse me, the web is still intact. And so, you know, that's the way I think about the temperature data. You know, we have all of these cross-cutting, interconnected things that lead to this, lead to the IPCC's famous statement that the warming is unequivocal, which I think is, is correct.